turn your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 6. Stand with me if you would, and I will read uh, these verses that we read this morning, and then we will, we will jump in where uh, we left off. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim. Each had six wings. With two he covered his face. With two he covered his feet. With two he flew. One called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the thresholds shook at the voice of him who called. And the house was filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, for I am lost. For I'm a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away, and your sin atoned for. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then I said, Here am I. Send me. And he said, Go and say to this people, Keep on hearing, but do not understand. Keep on seeing, but do not perceive. Make the heart of this people dull, and their ears heavy, and the blind their eyes, lest they see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and turn and be healed. And I said, How long, O Lord? And he said, Until cities lie waste without inhabitant. And houses without people, and the land is a desolate waste. And the Lord removes people far away, and the forsaken places are many in the midst of the land. And though a tenth remain in it, it will be burned again, like a terebinth or an oak, whose stump remains when it is felled. The holy seed is its stump. This is the inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient Word of God. As we read it, may we have washed over us the glory of God, the holiness of God. And like, like our Reformation heritage, be gripped anew and afresh to say, God being my helper, I will be, I will make a mark, I will make an impact for the glory of God in my own life, in my family, in His church. Because we know, if you read the end of the story, that it will be so throughout the world. Thank you. Please be seated. We uh, kind of gave you an outline of these verses in Isaiah this morning. I'll touch on that real quickly. We said there are six, uh, I see six uh, headings. The glory of God displayed in His holiness, verses 1 to 4. The gripping reality of sin in the presence of God's glorious holiness, verse 5. And the glorious cleansing power of God's atonement for sin, verses 6 and 7. And the glad response to willingly do the Lord's bidding, verse 8. The gut-wrenching result of not seeing the glory of God, verses 9 and 10. And then the ghastly outcome, when people refuse to live for God's glory, verses 11 to 13. We suggested this morning that the glory of God is the holiness of God put on display. It's the outshining of the divine characteristics of God. And you see this all through the Scripture. If you just, if you were, if you were to, wherever you're reading in your Bible reading now, now, just put on the lenses and say, okay, I want to see how this speaks of the glory of God. And page after page of Scripture uh, exalts God as being holy, W-H-O-L-L-Y, holy other, completely other. And yet, as we read in our text, and as we saw uh, vividly in the video, that which should destroy, because God's holiness is not primarily designed to destroy, that which should destroy us when sinners come into the presence of a holy God, he has, by His grace, for His glory, transformed so that it actually purifies. Um, so let's look. 
I want one more thing I want to say. God's glory is the outward radiance of the intrinsic beauty and greatness of his manifold perfections. Let's look now, just touch on real quickly. We talked about the, uh, the second heading, the gripping reality. I think part, <coughs> part of the problem today, we've lost the categories of sin, and so people don't see themselves as sinners. And I want to be careful. If we are saved by grace through faith, we are, we are sinners saved by grace. We still struggle with remaining sin. The, the man who wrote half the New Testament, the Apostle Paul in Romans 7, said, wretched man that I am. He doesn't say wretched man that I was, but now that I'm, no. He, and the wretchedness he experiences is the, is the reality of remaining sin in him. And he cries out in that seventh chapter of Romans after he's expressed his despair and frustration that the things he shouldn't do, he finds himself doing the things he should be doing. He, he, he finds it easy to leave undone. And he, and he comes and says, but thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. He comes back to where we must come back when we battle with sin. Now, if we're not battling remaining sin, then we're not going to come back where we need to come back. Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. And so there's a tension here. And so I just want, I want to suggest that we need to take inventory. Does my sin bother me? Does your sin bother you? Do we fall into the snare? Well, oh, everybody sins. That's true. But, but making that statement doesn't really address the matter of remaining sin. Doesn't, doesn't cause us to be hopeful for the day of glory when there will be no Sin remaining in us will be glorified, completely purified. There will be no sinful options in glory. That's, that's part of why it is called glory, to be in the glorious presence of God. So this gripping reality. Look, and the nearer you get to God, the closer you draw to God, the more remaining sin will be exposed, which I think, by the way, is why some people sh shirk back. But it is, it is all for as Romans 8, 20, all for his glory and for your good. Let's look thirdly now, get into the material for tonight, the glorious cleansing power of God's atonement for sin. Look at verse 6. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal, and he's taken with tongues from the altar. This altar here is the place of sacrifice. It is the place where, where when the sacrificial lamb is slain and offered and, and a portion burnt on the altar, it has purifying uh, effect, a forgiving effect. If you remember Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, once a year they would come and celebrate this and, and understand at that level that they, they had a fresh lease on life for another year. Okay. Hebrews 9 tells us that Jesus Christ came and offered himself once for all, not annually like, like bulls and goats and, and, and sheep, once for all. He satisfied it. So you have this powerful picture here of uh, cleansing, of atonement. And we need to, this is, when we, when we face our sinfulness, woe is me. We either face it as believers battling remaining sin, or we face it as those who are not true believers. And that can be somebody who has no, there's a spectrum here. It can go all the way from, from no interest in the things of God all the way to a religious upbringing, religious background, religious decisions that really were not saving decisions. And so it's very telling. But when we do, whether as an unbeliever, come face to face with our sin so that it, it seems it will consume us, it will crush us, we will, we will, it, Revelation, uh, we went through Revelation. Remember when, when, when the Lord's presence is made powerfully known, there are those who are not believers who will cry. Do what now? They will cry for the rocks to crush them. And what will they say? Matt and I were talking about this the other day. It's the, when, we, when we went through that in Revelation, I'll tell you, it's one of the most amazing descriptions in all of Scripture. Save us from the wrath of the Lamb. We don't know the Lamb that way. Save us from the wrath of the Lamb and from him who sits on the throne. That's what happens when, when as, a, as an unbeliever, you 
come square-faced to the glory of God. But as believers, when we come face-to-face with our sin, we are reminded that atonement has been made. This, in this picture here, this, this coal, this burning coal has come off the altar where atonement is made. And he touches Isaiah's mouth. Your guilt is taken away. Remember we talked about justification, sola fide. He pardons us for our sin and accepts us as righteous. Your guilt is taken away. Your sin is atoned for. And in this situation, it's not by anything Isaiah has done. It's by what has been done outside of him from the altar. So I want us to see the fourth place, the glad response to willingly do the Lord's bidding. When you, when you are convinced of your sinfulness and what that deserves, when you are assured and gripped that you have been saved by grace through faith, that combination evokes a response. I've told you about this book that I read years ago. I've cited it different times through the years. John Stott's little book, Our Guilty Silence. And he talks in that book about a cycle, an inevitable gospel cycle that comes into the life of one who is saved. He says, if you have been saved by grace through faith, you will be drawn to worship. You cannot escape it. You show me a person who is complacent about worship, I'll show you a person who doesn't really know saving grace. Just like you show me a person who claims to have been rescued from drowning, who is complacent about that, and I'll show you a person that I really wonder if that ever occurred or if it's just in his mind. Stott says, when you, when you have been rescued, you worship the one who rescued you. And he says, and when that happens, in this, in this book, Our Guilty Silence, when you worship the one who saved you, true worship, he said, provokes witness. We cannot help but tell what we've seen and heard. That was the, that was the description that the apostles gave in the first century when they were threatened, when they were beaten, when they were imprisoned. We cannot help. We can't help ourselves. And Stock goes on to say that when you, when you witness, <clears throat> when you speak to somebody about the Lord, you know what happens? Your heart gets stirred to worship. When you talk about, when I, and I'm just putting it on an on a earthly level, sort of carnal level. When I tell people about my wonderful wife, 43 years she has put up with me, uh, ministered to me, followed me, stood by me. The, when I talk to people about her, there's, there's stirred up in my heart a reminder of just how much I love her. Now that's on a small scale, on a much larger scale. When, you, when we talk to one another about the grace of God shown to us in salvation, it, it should provoke in us a sense of worship. So Stott says that's a cycle that if, we're, that if we're not careful, if we're not worshiping, if we get out of that, the cycle's broken and witness will not flow easily. Look at this verse. He has seen his sinfulness, his utter sinfulness, in the face of the glory of God, surrounded by seraphim crying, holy, holy, holy. He has acknowledged it. He has been assured by one of the seraphim that his, his sin has been atoned for. He's forgiven. He's cleansed. Verse 8, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send? And who will go for us? Now, Isaiah doesn't know where they're talking about going. <laughs> he doesn't know anything about the mission, doesn't know anything about the, the tenure of it. And just out of, the, out of the overflow of the heart, it says, here am I, send me. 
We sing, we sing hymns about that. We hear missionary sermons about it. But this is, the, this is the overflow. Here am I, send me. This glad response. And so I think I, I have to test myself. I was studying through this passage this week and I'm thinking, is my heart glad to respond to opportunities for mission and ministry? Does it continue to be glad? Because that's, if it's, if it's not, now here's, if I find myself in a, in a complacent state, then I need to go back and learn from that. I need, I need to stare into the Word and behold the glory of the Lord. I need to, I need to do what the psalmist says, to walk out one evening, and, and Karen and I, when we were on our vacation, we had one, one evening, particularly when we were able to see the stars. They were out, there was no ambient light where we were up in, up in Steamboat Springs, Colorado. And so we just started looking up at the sky. If, you, if you've been in this situation, you know what I'm talking about. The, the stars begin to just come. It's not, it's not like they weren't there. Your eyes adjust to what's there. And then, and then we were look, as we st- continued looking and looking and looking until Karen, I said, you see what looks like wisps of smoke or clouds? He said, yeah. I said, it's not what that is. That's clusters. That's galaxies. That's, and it's just breathtaking. The heavens declare the glory of God. I need, I, need to, I need to touch again anew and afresh how great our God is. And when I do that, when I read the Word and I look at His creation, are you looking to the, the face of a little newborn baby? You see the wonder of our God. And when you do that, you... You, give a, you have, a, have to take a heart check about your own and, and, and confess remaining sin. Confess dullness to, to God's presence, to the, how everything He made declares His glory. And when you do that, there's a heart, a willing heart that says, what could I not do? What would I not do for this God who's done so much for me through His Son? And so you, you begin to think in terms of life for the glory of God. Look at, uh, look at 1 Corinthians 10, 31. Paul's writing, to the, we'll look at this, by the way, in more detail when we, when we get to this section going through 1 Corinthians. We will get back to 1 Corinthians in the near future. Okay, I promise that. Paul concludes this. So whether you eat or drink, or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. We know we read this morning that all of sin falling short of the glory of God. So it's got to be an intentional, an intentional turn. Now think about what he said. He doesn't say when you go on mission, uh, when you pray, certainly is included. But he takes something very common. I would venture to say unless you are intentionally fasting, and even if you're intentionally fasting, people who counsel on fasting say you need to, have, you need to consume liquid. Whether you eat or drink something we do every day, several times a day, do all of the glory of God. He takes one of the most common things that is known to our existence here. Everything to the glory of God. And then Isaiah 43, six and seven. God says through the prophet, I will say to the north, give up to the south, do not withhold. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the end of the earth. Everyone who is called by my name, whom I created for my glory. Why did God make you in all things? The children's catechism asked to glorify him for his own glory. Whom I've created for my glory, whom I formed and made. You see, the great mission of the church is to declare God's glory among the nations. Some speak in terms of, of, of proclaiming the fame of his name. One way you can remember it, to make him famous. When I watch the news sometime in the evening, I think it's channel six, six o'clock news. Right after that, this thing comes on that just 
makes me want to vomit. It's uh, entertainment tonight or something. And they are glorying in all of these wicked people in Hollywood. They're just advancing the name and advancing their fame. And yet we're, just, we're supposed to do that about God. Look at, look at uh, Psalm 96, 1 to 3. Oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord and bless his name. Tell of his salvation from day to day. You see that, that cycle John Stott talks about? That willing response we see in Isaiah? Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous works among all the people. You can hear Jesus, when you, when you read it, hear Jesus saying, let your light so shine before men that they may observe your good works, and when they do so, they will be constrained to glorify your Father in heaven. That's why, by the way, when we're saved, he doesn't take us on to glory that day. He leaves us here to declare the fame of his name. In Ezekiel 39, 21, again, I will set my glory among the nations, and all the nations shall see my judgment that I've executed, and my hand that I have laid on them. Then again in Isaiah 66, just giving you a flavor of this, of this theme. Isaiah 66 verses 18 and 19, for I know their works and their thoughts. What does that sound like? Sounds like Revelation 2 and 3 to me. And the time is coming to gather all nations and tongues, and they shall come and shall see my glory. See, we talk about Philippians 2 from time to time. Every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess. It's not a question Will this one bow? Will this one confess? No, they shall, every person, every person you know, the hardest heart you know, the, the person who seems most distant from God, who's turned his or her back on God, will bow, will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God. That's what this is saying. They, they shall come and shall see my glory, and I will set a sign among them, and from them I will send survivors to the nations. Tarshish and Pool and Lud, who draw the bow to Tubal and Javan, to the coastlands far away, that have not heard my fame or seen my glory, and they shall declare my glory among the nations. There's, when Jesus was entering Jerusalem, what we call the triumphal entry, the Pharisees were frustrated. They said, tell the people to be quiet. They're, they're making a big, just it's a, it's a it's really embarrassing what's going on here. He said, if they shut up, the rocks will take up my name. He will be glorified. The question is, will I, will I get in on glorifying him verbally, declaring his name and his fame? And so you have this, this movement that comes. When you've seen your sin, you see your glory and you see your sin, and then, and then in the face of that you see his mercy because a part of the way he glorifies himself in Romans 9, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. Then you say, here am I, send me. But look, it's not all a bed of roses. Look at the fifth thing, the gut-wrenching result of not seeing the glory of God. Not everybody sees it. You, I would love to tell you that everybody you're praying for is gonna be saved, that everybody you witness to is gonna be saved. I don't think the scripture teaches that. It teaches us to pray for the lost. It teaches us to share the gospel with them. Isaiah says, here am I, send me, verse 9, 10. He said, go, we're sending you then. Go. And say to the people, keep on hearing, but do not understand. Keep on seeing, do not perceive. And then he says something really strange, that you have to have help from Jesus in Matthew's gospel when he, when he prays. I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you've hidden these things from the wise and the learned and revealed them to babes, even so, Father, for this seemed good in your sight. You have to have Jesus' help. Make the heart of this people dull, their ears heavy. In other words, the, the message you proclaim, think about this. And you, you've known people like this, by the way. When you go faithfully to declare the fame and the name and the glory of God, people will be hardened by that. 
Their ears heavy. They're weary of hearing it. Their eyes will be blinded. They, they won't see. And he says, lest they see with their ears. Don't they ask him in the, in the Gospels, why do you teach in parables? And I've, I've heard preachers through the years and have read, well, Jesus taught in parables because parables were stories that er, for every man. Every man knew the common experiences of stories. Well, that's true, but is that what Jesus says about why he was asked? In, in Matthew and in Mark 13, remember? Why do you teach in parables? I teach in parables because it's been given to you to know the secrets of the kingdom and not to them. His explanation for teaching in parables was to do exactly what's happening here in Isaiah. And that's a mystery, folks. Well, I can't, I can't, I'm not going to pretend you will. I, I'm going to unpack this for you. No, I'm not. I'm just going to stand in the face of it and say, oh, dear God, I know people right now that when I talk to them about the things of the Lord, they harden. And I pray, dear God, soften them. Melt them. The stony heart, do what you promised to do in the new covenants. You will take away the heart of stone and replace it with the heart of flesh. Jeremiah 31, Ezekiel 36. Oh, God. But it shouldn't surprise us if we encounter people like this. Isaiah's mission was that. Now, it says, lest they see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and turn and be healed. I'm sending you to a people, Isaiah, that you're going to preach to, preach faithfully to them. And you need to know that it's my purpose at this time is to make them grind their teeth when they hear your message from me. You remember the context. We've, we've looked at Isaiah on Sunday evening, a summary of that. And, uh, the people, God had a controversy with the people. They had taken his goodness, his kindness, squandered it on themselves. They had taken God for granted. They thought they could wink at his, his commandments, his prohibitions. They could ignore. He has a controversy. When you, when you read a little later here, he talks about when, because Isaiah's going to respond, well, how long, Lord? And I love that response. I mean, I, I, a lot of people would have said, I'm out. No, that's, that's not what I signed up for. I, didn't, I want to go somewhere where people are going to respond. I would remind you in the history of the prophets, we'll be seeing this as we go through the prophets on Sunday night. I'd remind you in the history of the prophets that the only place where there was a measurable response that was significant was in a place where the prophet who went there went there reluctantly and did not want the people to respond. His name is Jonah. The experience of Isaiah, we're going to be looking at, at Jeremiah. In the near future, Jeremiah is the weeping prophet. The reason he's a weeping prophet, he wept because no one believed what he said. When you study Jeremiah carefully, you discover there's not one evidence of one convert to the message Jeremiah proclaimed. But he proclaimed it faithfully. And so here you have this, this mystery in terms of the distinguishing grace of God. I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you've hidden these things from the wise and the learned. You've revealed them to, to babes, to people, the simple, the, not the religious erudite scholars, but to the simple people, the babes. And people say, well, why would he do that? I just don't understand. And I, I, don't, I don't have an answer that's going to satisfy you, but I have an answer. And Jesus' answer is, even so, Father, for it seemed good in your sight to do it. And if that makes sense to Jesus, then I'm just going to trust his wisdom in that. But you see it in this passage. You see it in Jesus' explanation of parables. You see it in the way he prays in the Gospels. And so this is God's marching orders for Isaiah. And it's gut-wrenching. And I would submit to you that we live in a culture increasingly hardened by the gospel. There's a gospel hardening that takes place. Some people are dull of hearing it, tired of hearing it. Others, when they hear it, think God's a bigot. The Bible's a book that promotes all these horrible things. The Bible needs to be banned. And we just faithfully preach the gospel. Even when people 
reject it. And people seem to get, be worse off after hearing it from us because we're called again to spread the name and the fame of our glorious God. I love Isaiah's response. The ghastly outcome when people refuse to live for God's glory. In that, in that description that God gives, Isaiah asks a question that I just love his commitment. How long, oh Lord? I said I'd go. I'm going. You're worthy of me telling about your glory. How long will this be my experience? And God said, and his answer was not an encouraging. Well, well, it's just going to be for a brief time, Isaiah. And then the people are going to respond. It's going to be, no, listen to it. Until cities lie waste without inhabitant. He's talking about the captivity here. And houses without people. The city's desolate, specifically house to house, Empty. And the land is a desolate waste, unfarmed, unfarmable. And the Lord removes people far away. You see the picture of captivity there. And the forsaken places are many in the midst of the land. Everywhere you look, you see former glory. You can travel Europe today and go to place after place that once were burgeoning uh, cathedrals that are now museums or a handful of people that meet there. And though a tenth remain, and we won't go into this in detail, but there is a, there is a biblical doctrine of the remnant that runs all through the Old Testament, the New Testament, even into the end of the book. God has always had a people. He always will have a people. When the Reformation occurred, there was a handful of folks that had the common burden. Some had gone before Martin Luther, some came alongside Martin Luther, some came after Martin Luther, but there were, the, I think it was Spurgeon said, the church had gone underground. He said, but like, like pure water, it will always break through the rocks, no matter how it appears, how difficult it appears to do so. And he says, though a tenth remain, God will always have a people. I don't know what the future holds in terms of what we will see individually in our witness, as a church in our witness. I would love, I, the deacons hear me say this almost every time we meet, my heart's desire, my prayer is that God would fill this place, whatever place he calls us to meet, to overflowing with people wanting to hear. I don't, and I don't, I don't mean church members from other churches. I mean people that, that did not know him, who've been arrested, of whatever means, who've been engaged by you and me and who have a hunger a thirst cultivated and want to know God, who've come to the end of their rope, need help, willing to listen where real help is found. And he says, even though a tenth remain, and then he, then he, you say, well, wow, it can't get worse than that. Yes, it can. It will be burned again. Like a terebinth or an oak, which... Uh, what I've read about this is they don't, if you set them on fire, they don't always burn down the first time. They'll be burned again. Maybe hollowed out and stuff, but you've got to torch them again to burn them to ashes to the ground. And he talks about this stump that remains. And this is the good news in this otherwise bleak description of what's coming for Isaiah. And the holy seed is its stump. What looks like total wasteland, what looks like a total lost cause is not that. Look again. A branch will rise out of Jesse. We're coming into the season as we move through Thanksgiving when 
when we will, we will con con concentrate more intently on the incarnation and, and those, all those prophecies about the coming of Messiah. And that stump is the holy seed. Out of that will spring the Messiah. So, what is our hope? What is your hope? It's to see God's glory. It may be daunting, wherever you are in the journey. If you've been complacent, to see God's glory is going gonna, is gonna to burn down that complacency. Maybe you've gone astray and, and dabbling in sin. To see God's glory is going to consume that. And so it's, it's something that, that we naturally want to shrink back from. But to see God's glory is our hope. Look at Romans 5, 2. where Paul begins to, to really plow into, and he does it in chapter 4, but more so in chapter 5, about uh, that we have peace with God. Romans 5, 2, through him, that is Jesus, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we're standing. And what's the result of that? And we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. You see, uh, they use the analogy of, of fire. Uh, we were gathered around a campfire uh, last night with the family cooking s'mores. And if you get too close to a fire, it will burn you. If you get too far away from a fire, you just, you're just watching flame. It does, it does you no good to warm you. But if you get in the right proximity with a fire, there's a warmth, a caring, a a beauty. We rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Our hope is to behold a new and afresh. John said, We beheld his glory. We sing, Turn your eyes upon Jesus. There's life for a look at the Savior and life more abundant and free. And we need to, we need to train ourselves when we get fixed on this culture and preoccupied with, with the shiny things, we need to, tr to turn and gaze upon the beauty of the Lord. Psalmist says, worship the Lord in the beauty of his holiness. Jude says it this way in Jude verse 24, now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. We need to remember that if God is for us, then it doesn't matter who can be against us. And if God is for us, then he is not against us. He is able to keep us from stumbling so as to fall away and present us blameless before the presence of his glory. Think about that. I was cited in the, in the video earlier. When you draw near to the glory of God as an unbeliever, it will consume you. But when you draw near to the glory of God as a follower of Jesus Christ, his glory shines and shows his work in a convincing way that you are in his presence, you are blameless. And the response is great joy. You see some themes here running? Romans 9, 23. Paul's talking about how, how God's plan unfolded very differently than what Saul the Pharisee thought it would. He says, in order to make known the riches of his glory for vessels of mercy, which he's prepared beforehand for glory. Our, our hope is to see, taste, experience, find comfort in the glory of God. And I told you, I think we re referenced this this morning, John 17, 24. Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me may be with me where I am to see my glory that you've given me because you loved me before the foundation of the world. It's interesting, John said, we beheld his glory in the incarnation. Jesus said, I want them, I want them to see my glory in heaven. Un, unhindered. The curtain drawn back completely. to behold the glory of the land. That experience we read about in Revelation 5, when they, people from every tribe and tongue and language and nation begin to cry, worthy 
is the Lamb who was slain. You purchased men for God from, from every tribe and, and language and tongue. And, and worthy, worthy, praising the Lamb. Hebrews says it this way, as Hebrews, the book of Hebrews opens up in verse 3, chapter 1. He's the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. He upholds the universe by the word of his power. And making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. He's talking about Jesus. You remember how Hebrews that God in past times and in various ways has spoken to us through the prophets. In these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. And then we, we, when we discover that our hope is to see God's glory in his son, that we will, we will participate in that. Listen to this from 1 Peter 5, verse 1. So I exhort the elders. This is Peter exhorting the, his fellow pastors. I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, as well as a partaker in the glory that's going to be revealed. He's talking about the transfiguration experience. He got a taste of it, but he understood from that that he and, and believers would be partakers in the glory that's going to be revealed again in heaven. And we know from Romans 8.30, at the end of that great chain of grace, those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. That hadn't happened yet. That hadn't happened yet. But it's spoken here as certain. That is certainly, and this is, I, I, I pity people who, who are in, in uh, gatherings of uh, faith groups that teach that you can lose your salvation. He speaks here of the certain, just as certainly as you were justified pardoned for your sins, accepted as righteous in the sight of God, not for anything you have done, but only for the sake of Jesus Christ, who he is, what he did, and your faith response to that. That as certainly as you were justified, you're certainly going to be glorified. That we will partake in that. Paul said in Romans 8, we are heirs of God, joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him that we might be glorified together. And so I want to close tonight. Just I want to read back through the passage we read responsibly this morning. I want to show you, this is Paul <clears throat> writing to the church at Ephesus. And he opens this letter with what many believe was, a, was or became a Trinitarian hymn of praise to Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But it also is a window into why he does what he does, the way he does it. Look at me at Ephesians chapter 1. We need to get to know the glory of God. Study the glory of Christ. Examine yourself. Recognize what glories in the world, I'll use that with quotes, seduce you and me. And why we find value in glories that are not God's glory. And then fight the fight of faith to make God's glory the greatest value. Listen to this. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He is speaking now of God the Father, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. You may say, well, I don't, man, I'm, I mean, I know I'm blessed, but I, sometimes I don't feel it in heavenly places. There's what you don't know about what God has done in Christ will be fully revealed, and you will be amazed. It's already set in motion in heavenly places. Even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that, that's a purpose clause, in order that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love he predestined us, that's Romans 8, 28 and following. For adoption, remember I told you before, justification is not 
is not where it stops. Justification is to be declared not guilty in the court of law, and before you leave the court of law, God says, I want to take you home. I'm adopting you. You're going to be my child. I want to raise you. I'm going to make you look just like my son over here. For destined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will. Notice the, what, what motivates him, the purpose of his will. And then here it is, to the praise of his glorious grace. This, that's, the, that's the goal. And he saves in such a way, it doesn't make sense to us, it doesn't fit our pattern, but he does it in such a way that he gets the glory so that we will praise his glorious grace. And you know what? If we're not doing that now, I promise you, when we walk through the gates, having passed through the, the great white throne judgment, there won't be any hesitation to praise the glorious grace. The better part of wisdom is to be students of the Word of God, get to know the Scripture, get to know the glory of God. So we're doing that now, praising His glorious grace, with which He has blessed us in the Beloved. You see, because it's, that's, the, that's the, the ground for blessing, is that He is glorious and His grace is glorious. Verse 7, in Him we have redemption through His blood. Now, now He's shifted here. And I want you to know that in this, in this uh, three, ver three stanza hymn, each stanza ends with some declaration of the praise of the glorious grace of God. Now he's talking about, having said the beloved, in him that is in Jesus, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace. There's, the, there's where the purpose comes in, which he lavished upon us. He doesn't, he doesn't give us grace in a, in a little dropper like you're feeding a baby bird you found fallen out of a nest. He lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight. He's done this according to what he knows we need, making known to us the mystery of his will, that unfolding of, of Christ in us, the hope of glory. According to his purpose, there again, that's what he doesn't do it to, to make sense to us. It's according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, that is in Christ, things in heaven, things on earth. In him we've obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. He brings that second stanza to a conclusion, and he has a lot to say about Jesus Christ, God's Son, who is, who is the glory of God walking. Show us the Father, they said. It would be enough. He said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. I and the Father are one. In him, verse 13, you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. Now we've come to the third person of the Trinity. The Holy Spirit. We've talked about this on Wednesday nights, the, the Holy Spirit who is the seal. He's, the, uh, he's God's stamp upon us which shows God's ownership of us and God's commitment to take care of all that he owns. You were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit who is the guarantee that, of our inheritance. He's the, he's the earnest money. How do we know God intends to bring us safely home? Because he's given us the Holy Spirit. And he will not, listen to me, he will not leave anyone on this earth when he burns it down, rolls it up like a scroll and blows it out like a candle. There will be no one left until the new heaven, the new earth comes. No one left who has the Holy Spirit in him. Because Jesus said he will not lose one of all the fathers given him. He's the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it, and that's in heaven. Why? To the praise of his glory. You see that? Everything God does, he does to the praise of his glory. Everything the Father does for the Son, he does for the praise of his glory. Everything the Son does for the Father, to the praise of his glory. Everything the Spirit does to the praise of the glory of God. And that's what Paul's after when he says, if this God is for us, who does all things after the counsel of his own will, to the praise of his glorious grace, then who can be against us? 
And this is what the reformers were gripped by as they read the scripture and saw how God operates and why God operates. And they looked at the prevailing church and said, this does not reflect that. Brothers and sisters, I grew up coming of age in the 60s, in the hippies. If it feels good, do it. Uh, and then the yippies came on the scene. And then the zippies came on the scene. And then we began, we have the, we have the, uh, the, the baby boomers and all these different, the Gen Xers, the, and now we have the millennials. And, and it, I would like to tell you that as those, as those generations have unfolded, that, that there's been an, a, a movement to, to, to put to death self and me, but it's not been the case. We're overrun today with people who think it's all about them. It's all about them. But the Bible, when you read the Bible, it says it's all about God. And we've got to swim upstream, and we've got to keep looking at the glory of God. And say, fill, fill my mind, fill my eyes, fill my heart. That's why I say we need another reformation. Church members are not moved, by and large, to think about the glory of God. We promise to teach them something that will tickle their particular fancy. We promise to teach them something that will, that will uh, make them feel better about this, feel better about that, help them to do better at this, do better at that. That, that whole therapeutic approach to preaching. And they'll flock to that. Tell them you're going to preach on the glory of God. They yawn at it. We need another reformation. I believe you're here tonight because you recognize that. Need a reformation in our congregation. We do not run out and try to change culture until we change the DNA of this church. Do you know, it started pretty inconspicuously in Wittenberg 500 years ago. And I believe sitting among us is someone who could say, who God would use to say, here I stand. Here I stand. So I thank you for listening through these six weeks, seven sermons, six videos on the Reformation. I thank you for not feeling like, well, I kind of, I'm kind of overdosing on this. I think I've had enough. I thank you for that. But you said, I, I need to wrestle with this. And my prayer for you, for each one of you, is that just as the Shekinah came down into the tabernacle, that the glory of God would come and rest upon you so heavily that you, you would be one that when people encounter, like they encountered Moses, that the Shekinah would reflect from you. Maybe terrifying, but ultimately, ultimately, being the light that they need when they're convinced that they're walking in utter darkness. That the light of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ that has shined in you here who are followers of Christ would be reflected and that becoming a follower of Christ would become a, a magnetic appeal. And my prayer for you, my prayer for me is that you will yet, before you go home to glory, you will yet see men and women, boys and girls, come to faith in Christ through your life, your love, your labors, your prayers, your witness. Let's pray.